I'll do a little bit of um, Sorcerer's Stone and then get into um, Chamber of Secrets. I'll do the, the, as I said, you know, the quick version of Sorcerer's Stone, the end of kind of Sorcerer's Stone. Because a lot of what told change gears. <laughs> a lot of what Rowling is doing in the first three books okay, is she's got to set up her world. You know, Tolkien does that in The Lord of the Rings primarily how? Well, he does have the prologue, you know, where he talks about hobbits and stuff, and does a little bit about the, the ring. Um, he does have the hobbit, but you can't assume that people have read, I can't assume that any of you had, had read the hobbit. Um, Tolkien's original readers in the 1950s would have read the hobbit. It's one of the reasons, you know, his publisher said, go ahead. But it's those two main chapters that I talked about in the first book. In, in the first volume, Shadow of the Past, where he gives us a lot of background information, and then Council of Elrond, where he gives us more background information that we need in order to understand everything that flows afterward. Rowling is kind of doing the same thing, though she doesn't have those kinds of chapters in the first, um, in the first novel. And hopefully you did watch those Lectures because I, I give some background information, you know, about how she came up with the idea and, and all that kind of stuff. But also, you know, the difference in titles. Because I'm going to refer to Philosopher's Stone. Because this is an asinine, just idiotic, stupid title. Why? Because there is a real, or was a real, it was thought, okay, thing called the Philosopher's Stone. This is, this is not something she makes up. This is part of human intellectual history that goes back probably three to 4,000 years. And there are still people today trying to find slash create a Philosopher's Stone. It is one of the central items, things, goals of the medieval science of alchemy. Right? And it was not, and, and I want to put this, it was not as it is usually put, you know, that you could use it to turn base metal into gold, okay, or to create an elixir of life. Those were surface level understandings of what the Philosopher's Stone would do. What the Philosopher's Stone was actually all about. If I pass out from lack of oxygen, just, you know, leave me. Um, was all about transformation. Self-transformation. See, base metal to gold is transforming, right? The elixir of life, something that you could drink that would confer immortality. You have to keep drinking, and it's not, you know, one sip and you're good. Um, that's all about changing something from one level of existence to another level of existence, all right? And it was thought that if you could create this Philosopher's Stone, it's also called the specular, in some places, stone, all right? That that could happen, all right? So in the, so where'd Sorcerer's Stone come from? Is that this is used, this term, this phrase, is used in medieval literature, in ancient China, ancient Egypt. Nobody had ever used the phrase Sorcerer's Stone until Arthur A. Levine, the American publisher, in 1997. Actually, a little bit earlier when he negotiated, you know, the contract and all that kind of stuff with J.K. Rowling. He said... American parents will never buy a book for their children with the word philosopher in the title. Moron. He's a moron for saying that. Because American 
parents did, because after a while, this did get published in America. I mean, it wasn't wildly published, but you can get Amer you know, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, right? So he changed it to Sorcerers. Changing it to Sorcerers immediately created a new problem. What's the new problem? Whack, I'm a Christian, I'm a big O Orthodox, you know, like Greek, Russian, etc. Orthodox Christian. It brought the wackos out of the woodwork. I, I used to teach a, a graduate course, Old English and Beowulf and stuff. And one of my students one semester uh, was a woman, I think her husband was a minister, five kids, you know, the whole nine yards. And she was like, Dr. Sherman, I just cannot believe you teach those books. And let your children, I've got four kids, let your, and I said, I not only teach them, I encourage my kids and others to read them. And I said, you know, and as, and I can't remember her name, but as a Christian, you know, you ought to read things before you burn them. She kind of, you know, didn't really care for that. And I said, because if you were to read this, and if all the wackos wanted to burn it and, you know, Jake and Rowling at the stake would read it, they would see this is not antithetical. Not just this one, also. To Christianity. Right? J.K. Rowling, if you watch the lecture, you heard this, but I'll give it again briefly. J.K. Rowling, in an interview in about 2001, 2002, I think it was the Toronto, no, the Vancouver Sun, an interviewer asked her and said, you know, you're a Christian. She said, yes, I am. You know, what strike, what denomination, and, you know, Church of Scotland, Presbyterian. And the interviewer said, well, what effect does that have on your writing? That is, what effect does your Christianity have on your novels? I mean, because Christians are out there saying your books should be banned, they should be removed from school libraries, you know, all this kind of stuff. And she said, well, if I were to tell you that, it would give away the end. Because by 2002, 2000, late 2001, she already knew. In fact, she, she tells in a variety of interviews. She knew when she wrote the first book pretty much how the seventh book would end. That is, she had this story designed in the big particulars. Little parts changed. I mean, she, she said at one point she had the final sentence written. By the time she came and finished book seven, that final sentence had changed, right? Because the story grew and such. And, and you're going to find one thing I'm going to point out, and I'm sorry if you're a rolling aficionado slash lover. She's not a good writer. She's a great storyteller. She's the kind of person I would love to sit around a campfire out in the woods and say, oh, tell me a story. Tolkien is a great writer, right? Because he... He ties together all the loose threads. These books have a lot of loose threads that she attempts to tie together in Pottermore and other things. Okay? And there's problems with some of that. And I'm going to point out errors. So I'll, I'll tell you right now. And there's some blurry, book four, man. There's one so big that you could drive, you could literally, because of the Bigness of this error, you could drive a truck through it. It's, it's a literal physical distance size error that's in the book. Okay? <clears throat> Where was I going with all that? I can't remember. Um, so, back to transformation. So she's, she has to set up her world. How does she do that? How does the book open? What are we told about the Dursleys? They're perfectly normal, thank you very much. They don't hold to anything strange or mysterious. Okay. So what, what binary kind of opposition do we see at the beginning? Normality, right? And then what's the opposite of that? Abnormality? The usual, the unusual, the ordinary, the extraordinary, etc. Okay? Where's Harry? 
when we begin, he's over here, right? Yeah, kind of. Hair gets cut, it grows immediately. Dudley and his gang want to beat up on him. He's suddenly blown up on the top of the gymnasium. That would be like being blown from the ground outside Peck Hall to the roof. A 90-pound boy, assuming he's 90 pounds then or 80 pounds, even a 120-mile-an-hour wind isn't going to pick him up off the ground and put him up there. So there's something different, you know. Right? He discovers on his 11th birthday he's what? He's a wizard. His parents were wizards. They were murdered by the most powerful dark wizard, you know, in recent memory, et cetera, et cetera. He goes off to Hogwarts. Describe Hogwarts. Is it Peck Hall? God, no. It's not Peck Hall. Right? What well, is one big difference? What does it not have? Electricity. Electricity. Modern technology. It's set seemingly kind of when? Middle Ages. Okay. How do you even get to Hogwarts? Well, you take a train. The train doesn't take you exactly to Hogwarts. And it's a steam train, which is 19th century. But it takes you to Hogsmeade. How do you get to Hogwarts from Hogsmeade? You take a carriage, a coach. Okay, so that takes you back a couple hundred more years. And then you get to Hogwarts itself, and it's lit entirely by candles. Not kerosene, candles, right? So we're not in Kansas anymore, right? This is, this is otherworldly-ish. She has to cradle it. How does she do it? She does it through description. We get some of it through speech, that is, through people talking and such. Right? We find out, you know, Stairways magically move on their own in the in the building and such. We meet creatures that are not like creatures we normally see around here. For example, troll. There's a troll in the basement. We don't meet many, um, you know, unless you're online. We don't meet many trolls, you know, today and such. Right? What kind of classes does Harry take? Does he have general ed courses? Kind of. Transfiguration, potions, defense against the dark arts, those are all gen ed. The only thing is, they continue through all seven years. Now, depending upon what you want to do when you graduate and such. So she has to create all that. She has to create all of that out of whole cloth for, for us. Because she doesn't have anything before these that we can jump into. So we, we get all that, and we get the basic premise. What's the basic premise? What's gone missing? This thing, okay? Notice at the beginning, by the way, when Harry goes to, to this place, say that. I got to help. Say it fast. How do you get to Diagon Alley? How do you get, literally, how do you get to it? You have to go where first? The leaky cauldron. Where's the leaky cauldron? Now, we're not told in this book. We are told later books. The street that it's on. It's on Charing Cross Road in London. When I used to teach my Harry Potter course in London, you know, we, we, you know, our first field trip would be a walking field trip of sites in London used for the films. And it was, depending on which route I created, it was anywhere from five to seven miles. Okay? And we would hit all these sites, and we would part of it would be walking up Charing Cross Road. Well, it's between a record store and a bookstore. Right? There is no store anywhere on Charing Cross Road where you have a record store next to a bookstore. That's part of the false part that she created, all right? 
Why didn't you say it quickly? Because of the lecture or did you pick it up on your own? Okay. Diagonally. Why diagonally? Who can't find diagonality? Muggles. I would, you know, it could be a big broad and I'd walk right past it. About as muggle as you get, okay? So diagonally, what does that imply? It's off here, right? It's not, in other words, how do you have to perceive? How do you have to see? You can't look for it. It's got to come out of like peripheral vision. What is that? What is, what is she implying there? Whether it's intentional or not, this could be part of J.K. Rowling's subconscious. I don't think it is. I think it's entirely intentional. Right? But it, it might be subconscious. It's kind of this, you know, our means of perception seems to be most often we look straight on at things. Maybe we need to step outside a little bit and look slightly askew. And then we'll do, we'll do what? We'll see a little differently. Think of Frodo. What happens to Frodo throughout the course of the novels? Or throughout the course of Lord of the Rings? What happens to his perception? Think of him at the beginning. He is just an enemy and deserves death. He says. And then later, now that I do see him, I pity him. Saruman at the end. Sam's getting ready to, you know, gut him. And what does Frodo do? Shouldn't talk about this because it's on the exam. <laughs> no, he hasn't hurt me. He was once of an order, high and noble. And what else? Two more things. I hope he finds his cure. In other words, Frodo goes from being kind of hot headed to Gandalf like. Right? He hopes Sarah Man can find his cure. What is Sarah Man? How does Sarah Man respond? You have grown wise, he says, in merciful. I hate <laughs> your mercy. Right. He wants Frodo to do what? Kill him out of anger. And Frodo even says, I will not have him slain in this evil mood. That if, if he, he's kind of a blind, if he must be slain, that judgment must be what? Passionless. Emotionless. It's got to be based on facts, not anger, resentment, hatred, revenge, etc. etc. Okay? We're going to see that same kind of mentality in these books. Right? So, we find out the stone's been, been stolen. How does she create the, the mystery, the detective fiction? Where, where do the things kind of really come to a head? Where does Harry put two and two together? And I don't mean, you know, through the trap door, because it's before that. It's going to be in a location that figures prominently, not necessarily in every book, but in several of the books. I'll give you a little clue. It figures prominently in Chamber of Secrets when Harry and Ron go off to find Aragog. Okay? It figures prominently in book three. The Prisoner of Azkaban. Book four, Harry meets Crumb at this location. Book five, kind of, a little bit. Book six, not so much. In book seven, you could say the climax happens it's the Forbidden Forest. Okay. So, what happens in the Forbidden Forest in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? 
Who does he meet? Remember, he's got detention. He's out there with Fang and um, Malfoy. What are they looking for? They're looking for the hurt unicorn. They're looking for what's hurting the unicorn. And they see the thing, right? But what does Harry do? Malfoy, you go first. No. He puts his arm out to stop him. Okay. And who shows up? Who rescues him? Centaurs. Okay. What are centaurs? Literally, what are physically? Half man, half horse. Remember, I put up here before you know that great chain of being idea where you have the angelic supernatural realm up here, the beastly animal realm, and humans are somewhere in between it. Where would a centaur be there between human and beast? They have animalistic qualities and they have human qualities, right? What are they kind of known for within this world? Astrology, not astronomy, notice. They can read the signs of the planets and stars, all right? So what does Ferenz, that's the name of the one that helped Harry, what, what does he do? What does he help Harry see or understand or perceive? Who might there be that could benefit from a mixture that would kind of give you a half-life, a, a half-immortality, so to speak. Yeah, it takes a lot of leading, because Harry's not the brightest bulb in the box, right? I mean, if it were Hermione, she'd know immediately. If it were Ron, it'd take a little more leading, right? But he gets the point. And he puts two and two together. The Philosopher's Stone is what is missing. It's the Philosopher's Stone that is hidden somewhere up at the Capitol. All right? Back up for just a, a moment. When Harry gets the invisibility cloak, notice something that confers invisibility. Lord of the Rings, something that confers invisibility. Tolkien in that SM Fairy story mentions invisibility that there is something about invisibility that appeals to our human mass collective unconscious somehow. We want that kind of, maybe it's anonymity. Who knows? So he gets the invisibility cloak and he goes off looking for, you know, clues. And that one day he goes into the room with the mirror. What does he see in the mirror? He sees his, his family. Okay? What does he not see in the mirror? Does he see himself? Yes, he does. He sees himself what? Surrounded by everybody. What does Dumbledore say the mirror shows? Heart's deepest desires. Okay. Think about that episode for just a moment. When Harry first sees them, what does he literally see? He sees his mother and father, right? What is his mother doing when he first sees her? She's crying. Okay. What does he do? Turns around, there's nobody there. He turns around again. She's crying and smiling. And then he does this. What does his father do at that point? He puts his arms around her. Why? It's his deepest desire to see his mother weeping over him and to see his father caressing and comforting her. That's kind of weird. Or maybe the mirror shows more than what Dumbledore tells Harry it shows. Or maybe Dumbledore isn't even entirely 
Maybe Dumbledore doesn't know entirely what the mirror shows. Because again, think of that moment. He sees them, he turns around, looks back, and the cry, the, the tears, turn to a smile. What is that telling us? This is real. What he's seeing in the mirror is real. It is happening in the present. Okay, so where are they? If number four Privet Drive is this world, and Hogwarts is another world, what is the world of the mirror? An even higher world, different plane? Material, if what is seen in the mirror is what's the opposite of material, immaterial, spiritual, then where's Hogwarts? It's kind of on the path to that, right? This idea is going to be important in book five, really important in book five. Okay. Get to the end. So Harry goes through the trap door, right? He's got to get through, he's got to get past all the little tests. Does he do it on his own? No. Why not? For the exact same reason Frodo can't achieve the quest on his own. By the way, who achieves the quest? Gollum does. When Frodo says, I will not do the thing I've come to do. The ring is mine. At that point, he is a 100% total failure. Why? Combine the two books. Combine the Lord of the Rings with this. Or this world, at least. The ring has done what to Frodo? It's put an imperious curse on him. It has taken away his will. It has possessed him entirely. We were told that in the second chapter, right? A mortal who possesses the ring long enough, Frodo, Gandalf says, will become possessed by the ring. What happens to the ring, the closer and closer and closer, it gets to its place of creation. Its power gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Think of the scene, we're going to get back to this in just a second. Think of the scene on Mount Doom when Gollum tries to attack. Right? And Sam's knocked on the ground and he sees, and there's Frodo, and there's Gollum, and Gollum's this shriveled thing, you know. And what happens, what comes out of Frodo? A voice, right? Where does the voice come from? The wheel of fire at his chest. And it says, if you touch me again, you will be cast into the fire. Uh, okay. <laughs> Who's saying that? Has Frodo suddenly become a ventriloquist? No. Is it the ring speaking? Is it the ring keeping Gollum to his promise on the precious? Is this the will, the power that Sauron put into the ring, speaking, right? So Frodo goes, uh, where he's at, <laughs> Harry, Harry goes through the trap door, he gets past all the things, okay? Notice, in one of those tests, what must Ron do? He's got to sacrifice himself. There's always got to be some, you know, just like Gollum, just like Gollum, just like Gandalf does at Kazadun, right? He gets through and he meets Quirrell. Why is he so surprised? He always thought it was going to be Snake. Why? He's fishy. Harry doesn't like him. Why else? He's seen him in so many places. 
Can you see the coral on the floor? This is what happened here. What does coral say? He really does seem the part, doesn't he? In other words, what has Roland been doing throughout the book? Just follow these breadcrumbs. Or, to use another analogy, here's a red herring. Chase it. We, we get this image of snake beginning in book one as what? What kind of image is used to describe him at times? And it continues through book six. Take that back. Continues through book seven. It, it's not his physical appearance. It's how he comes across at times. Actually, there is going to be a physical appearance in book seven. And there's going to be an idea planted in book three. A bat. He's described as being bat -like. And we're going to see in book seven, he's going to turn, he's going to jump through a window and fly away like a bat. All that imagery is all one great big fat red hair. It's all designed to distract. Okay. So he gets through the trap door, he meets Quirrell, and what does he learn from Quirrell? Snape's been trying to protect him. Why? Because of something his father did. He's trying to pay him back. Okay? What else does he learn from Quirrell? What does Quirrell say about good and evil? There is no such thing as good. He says, my master taught me, how do we put it, about the ridiculous ideas of good and evil, he says, yep, Lord, page 291, a foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. What's he mean, mean, what's he mean ridiculous ideas about good and evil? That there are such categories. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong it was. There is no good and evil. Right? That's why those ideas that he held were ridiculous. There is no good and evil. There is only power. In those, notice the construction here. In those too weak to seek it. Not. He doesn't say. There is only power and those strong enough to wield it. Why not? Why put it and those too weak to seek it. <coughs> Louder? Okay, possibly. What do you do with those, with slash two, those who are too weak to seek power? You crush them. You, you step on them as you go to achieve your power. Right? I mean, this is the, the Darwinian ideology taken to its extreme. Because what do we get from Darwin? What's the phrase? Survival of the fittest. What's fittest mean? It's not only power of those fit for the situation, right? Or the conditions. Because if you've got gills and you suddenly find yourself on land, you're not fit. <laughs> so it's those who adapt. Well, that's an aspect of power. There is no good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. Right? And then he talks about serving him, etc., etc. And Harry defeats him. How? Touches him. In the book, does he do what happens to him, Quirrell, in the film, where he explodes into thousands of little pieces of dust and stuff? No. No, we're not actually told what happens to him. Other than that, 
you know, his master left him, left him, showing him such mercy as he shows, you know, all of his followers, etc. Right? So why was Harry able to touch him? Why was Harry able to essentially kill him that way? His mother's love had protected him, Dumbledore said. So Harry has his meeting with Dumbledore. And notice, Harry won't let go of one kind of main idea. Why was Voldemort after him? What's Dumbledore's response? Yeah, I'll tell you in book five. We have four more books to go through, Harry. He says, I'm going to come back to something earlier. He says, the first thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. Well, that's a lie. He can tell him. He chooses not to tell him. Okay. Mere supposition, based not at all on the next following books. Why does Dumbledore say, I cannot tell you, at this point? What does he think about Harry? He's too young. He's an 11 year old kid. Okay. And again, not saying anything about the later books. He's an 11 year old kid who's just done what, though? He's read the world of Hitler's right hand man. I don't mean Voldemort, by the way. I'm using Hitler as a stand in for Voldemort. Quirrell is the right hand man, so to speak, for Voldemort. There is a Hitler Voldemort connection, though. Pretty big one. Not just the ideology. Okay, go back for a moment. So, Harry's talking with Dumbledore, page 296 and 97, and they're talking about the stone. And Dumbledore says the stone's been destroyed. Harry, but your friend, Nicholas Flamel. Dumbledore. Oh, you know about Nicholas. You did do the thing properly. Nicholas Flamel, by the way, real person, really married to a woman named Perinel. They were 16th century, I believe, might have been 17th, uh, French alchemists. All right? Notice, you did do the thing properly. What does the did mean? It's called an emphatic do clause. Right? It's emphatic because it's telling us Dumbledore knew Harry would do this. And he's saying, you actually did research. You went to the library and looked things up. Kind of get the idea that Dumbledore, as headmaster, has an idea about how each of the students is doing in their studies. And Harry's, you know, eh, if it weren't for Hermione, probably wouldn't be progressing each year. So, he says, we've had a little chat. They have enough elixir to set their affairs in order, and then, yes, they will die. Dumbledore smiles, and Harry's like, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. You know, that by the way, that's a, that's a money quote from this book. Each of the books, well, first five and a half, <laughs> end with Dumbledore debriefing Harry. And the purpose of that debrief is for Harry to learn the lesson he needs to learn. What's the other reason for that debrief? For us to learn the lesson Rowling wants us to learn. See, we're the stand-in for Harry. Or Harry represents us. So when we hear, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure, that's Rowling telling us, or, put it this way, telling her intended audience, 10, 11, year old, 11 years old, right? Death isn't something to be feared. 
you know, the storm is really not such a wonderful thing. As much money in life as you could want. And Harry's probably thinking, what? How has Harry's life been monetary-wise? You're shaking your head. He doesn't have squat. How do his aunt and uncle treat him? They abuse him. Maybe not physically, but definitely there's emotional abuse. Okay. What kind of clothes does he wear? Second hand, hand me downs from his big, obese, grotesquely fat cousin. Right? As much money in life as you could want. Big moral lesson in the next sentence. The two things most human beings choose above all. Right? Who wants to die? We've got billion dollar industries designed to pretend we don't have to die. Cosmetic industries, plastic surgery industries. I'm not even getting into pharmaceuticals, you know, in the healthcare industry, right? The two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. Notice what Dumbledore said. Those are the two things most humans would want. And yet, we have a knack for choosing precisely those things that are worst. There's no other way to read that sentence than Dumbledore to me. Earthly immortality and earthly wealth are the two worst things we could possibly Think of Lord of the Rings. Think of Gollum. Gollum's second to last words. His last words are what? Creation! <laughs> As he falls into the abyss. Second to last words are to Sam after Frodo leaves to go up to the Sabbath Mount, the entrance to Mount Doom. What are his words to Sam? Anybody remember? When the precious goes, we will go to dust. We'll become dust. Ashes and dust. And he just begs for a little more time. He knows entirely what's going to happen. Notice, why does he say that? It's because of how long he has lived beyond his normal lifespan. You know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these other, in my opinion, slightly whack jobs, want to try to extend their lives to the hundreds, two hundreds. What does that imply? Are you going to do that for your children? Your spouse slash is? Because uh, unless you do, what are you going to see a lot happen? Death of loved ones. And you're just going to keep on going like being a judge of my life. Dumbledore seems to apply. No, 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 no. Not the, not the best thing to do. Okay? So that's when they talk about, you know, um, why he can't tell him and he talked about his mother and his mother's love has left you know a mark and he says no 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 not a physical mark because Harry's like weird he says no not a physical mark alright so chamber of secrets what does Harry now have when we get to the end of the first book I mean, it starts pretty soon, early on in the first book. But what's he now have that he hasn't had in his previous 10 years? Something to look forward to? Friends! He's got actual friends. He's got Ron and Hermione. I mean, these are the three musketeers, right? All for one, one for all. Right? 
And yet, friends are supposed to stay in touch with friends. No, and he's not gotten any letters. And then he discovers Dobby. We won't talk about much about Yeah, we will talk a lot about Dobby. We will talk about Dobby later on. How does Dobby look at Harry Potter? Like he is a god. Ooh, really close. Really close. Savior. Look at his words to Harry. He says, Harry meets Dobby and asks him to have a seat. Page 13. Dobby says, sit down, never, never. You know, I didn't mean to offend you. He says, offend Dobby. Dobby has never been asked to sit down by a wizard. Life in equal, right? <coughs> Dobby goes, you know, starts banging his head and stuff. And says he had to punish himself. He almost spoke ill against his masters. Harry, bottom 14. Why don't you leave? Why don't you escape? How self must be set free. And he tells him, you know, some other. And Harry, and I thought I had it bad. Staying here for another four weeks. Notice, Dobby says, a house self can only be set free by his masters. And Harry, and I'm only in prison for four more weeks. What's Harry starting to do? Pity Dobby. This makes the Dursley sound almost human. Can't anyone help you? Can't I? <coughs> yes, I really do wish to destroy the ring. Or rather, I for the ring to be destroyed, Frodo says. Right? Harry, can't anyone, who's anyone mean? You, <laughs> you, 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 not me. Someone out there. Can't I? And then he steps into the Savior's shoes. Dobby has heard of your greatness, sir, but of your goodness. What's his greatness that Dobby's heard of? He defeated Lord Voldemort the previous year. Right? Why does he then say of your goodness? What's Dobby equating goodness with? This desire to help others. <coughs> In my fantasy lit class, we just, well, they finished because I was sick all last week. We finished the Chronicles of Perdain, Lloyd Alexander series. <coughs> if you've never read it, I strongly encourage it. Where the main character, Taryn, says at the conclusion to the series, you know, he starts off as 11, 12, maybe 13 years old, and he wants to be a hero. He wants honor and fame and glory. He wants to be a, this great warrior and stuff. And he learns, he comes to almost the conclusion of the fifth book. And he says, hero is someone who does more for others than for himself. In other words, it's not about me. It's about what you need and what you need and what you need and what you need. All right? That's what Dobby is saying. I hadn't heard about your goodness. You're willing to step into the breach to solve the problem. And Harry's like, I don't know what you've heard about me. Harry Potter. And now notice what Dobby does. Dobby hears what Harry says. I never made this kind of connection before. Especially important with this. Dobby hears what Harry says, and he interprets it for us. Okay? So Dobby heard this, can't I help you? And he interprets that. That's goodness. Harry says, whatever you hear about my greatness, a load of rubbish. Dobby hears that, and he interprets it. Harry Potter is humble and modest. So we've just had Dobby name three virtues. Right? He's good, he's humble, he's modest. Dobby never, uh, he goes on. 
Harry Potter speaks not of his triumph over he and Harry mentions the name. Okay. And he mentions Harry Potter met the Dark Lord for a second time weeks ago. Harry Potter escaped yet again. Harry nods. And what is notice? It's like he's interpreting the nod. Harry Potter is valiant and bold. So good, humble, modest, valiant, bold. Pretty much all qualities of what? Hero. Who what else? Gryffindors. Okay. I don't have time for this. That comes from Griffin to or what's a griffin? It's a lion eagle mix. Door. Notice I'm not pronouncing it door. It doesn't mean this. It's of, that's the d, or, it's French. Gold. It's a lion eagle of gold. Why lion and eagle? What are each of those respective animals? Kingdoms of their respective areas. Lion, king of the beasts, eagles, king of the birds. In other words, earth, heaven. Here's a Christ figure. Not Christ, Christ figure. How so? Earth, human, heaven, God. In traditional Christian theology, Jesus is Fully God, fully man, right? And Jesus is what? What's one of the names he's called? Messiah. What does Messiah mean? Anointed one. It's also the chosen one. Well, we're going to hear that phrase come up later on in the Harry Potter novels. It's not saying he's Jesus. I'm not saying he represents Jesus. Don't, don't. Misunderstand me. This isn't allegory. I'm saying she's using this symbolism intentionally. It's very, all the symbolism in these novels is entirely intentional. Rowling was a um, medieval romance major. Romance languages, French, Latin, if I remember correctly, and medieval studies. She didn't get into Oxford, started at Exeter University. But she read widely in medieval literature. So she understands how all these symbols are used. Okay, we'll stop there since we're a couple minutes over. Um, we'll probably come close to finishing Chamber of Secrets on Wednesday, whatever the day is.